Hi everybody, I'm Tim from TroutandFeather.com and thanks for viewing this YouTube fly tying tutorial on Tube Flies Part 4. In case you've missed any of the prior episodes, I'll put a link to Part 3 on the screen right now. If you click that at the very beginning, there are additional links to Parts 1 and 2. Thus, I recommend you going back and watching those three prior episodes before this one. For all of you who have watched them, let's move forward because this is without a doubt going to be my favorite episode in this series of tube flies. Because in part four, I'm going to be talking about and examining the system that really got me interested in just jumping headfirst into this world. So let me put down my mug. I'm going to hold up the magazine that I referenced in part one. This is the April-May 2014 issue of Fly Fisherman. If you're anything like me, you probably get two or three of these subscriptions. They come monthly or quarterly, and whenever I received this one, I was immediately interested because I saw on the front the word Pennsylvania. I live in western Pennsylvania, and I wanted to read this article, which is a great one by Mike Heck. So I read that article, then looked through a couple other sections, and then slowly began to digest the rest of this magazine. And as I'm reading through it, one of the first main featured articles was written by April Vokey. It was an article entitled, Stack It Up. In that article, April talked about the world of tube flies and how she got interested in it. It was really simple. Um, she was interested in the, the steelhead, the salmon fishing, and she knew that hooks were really expensive and she knew about this system that could integrate really just everyday materials. You didn't need a lot of hooks. Whenever you had your patterns, you didn't have to worry about getting them all tangled together in the fly boxes. So it was just a really great system for her and then it eventually led her to this stack system. For the stack system, imagine a tube fly, a smaller tube fly that's made out of one material or it's one color. And then imagine a second one of maybe another color but it's the same material. Then a third one, same color but different material. And being able to have all three on your line at the same time and then a hook at the end. And have these different materials in different colors just breathing differently in the water and just pulsating in different actions. So what she slowly began to develop was a series or a system of tube fly fishing in which she had these different tubes and she would stack them differently based on her fishing needs. If she didn't need a lot, she would only have one or two of these on. If she needed more, she could put three or even four tubes on depending on the size. So whenever you kind of think about that, it really changes the world of fly fishing. You don't just have these materials that are tied on one hook and that's your fly. Instead, you can kind of look at it as a hook and then multiple sections of a fly that are kind of disassembled, but you can reassemble them at the moment you most critically need them on the stream, on the lake, wherever you're fly fishing. Well, that was a really neat article. I was interested in tube flies, but it didn't really say, it didn't tell me like, hey, go all in yet. I continued to read in this magazine and sure enough, a couple sections later, I hit an article that was written by Tom Rosenbauer. If that name rings a bell, you may have read one of his prior books or you may associate it with Orvis because he works for them. This article was titled Saltwater Tubes and once I read this article, I immediately was all in regarding the world of tube fly tying and fly fishing. What Tom did in this article was talk about this series that he didn't really have a great title for, but on the cover it kind of called it the Mix and Match series. So what Tom looked at was this series of heads and tails. So you have a bunch of heads tied on tubes and a bunch of tails tied on tubes. But we're not talking about just like average heads and tails. For the heads, picture all the flies that you fish, mainly bait fish imitations. We're talking clousers, deceivers, marabou heads, gurgler heads, the sky's the limit. So he has all these different heads, different sizes, different colors, different materials. And then he has a whole series of tails, marabou, rubber legs, saddle hackle, the list goes on. The beauty is if you want a clouser, you can get put a clouser head with a bucktail tail and put them together, there's your tube fly. You ever try a clouser head with a marabou tail? Well, you can now because you have that marabou, marabou tail on your tube fly section. So once I read this, I really thought, wow, this is something I've missed out on. I really have to just go all in right now. Because though Tom was focused on saltwater fly fishing, I quickly realized that this could be integrated into basically any fly fishing out there. He did say there were limitations with some species, but for the most part, if you're a trout fisherman, if you're a bass fisherman, salmon, steelhead, striped bass, 
this system will work for you. And I really encourage you to get out there and try it. After I read that second article, I immediately went out. I bought a beginning kit for tube fly tying, and I was all in from that moment. And this is April, May 2014. I've been tying for 25 years. That was my 25th year. I had never tied a tube fly, and that quickly changed after reading these two articles. So in this part four of this tube fly series, I'm going to show you some of these heads and some of these tails that Tom suggests tying. I'm going to tie a couple of them just so you get an idea of how they, easy they are to tie. But then most importantly, I'm going to show them to you together, show you some of the possible combinations, but then most importantly, let your creativity run wild because I can show you what I'm thinking, but I have a feeling that you're probably going to have some great ideas out there too. And I really encourage you to share those in the comment section of this video. Finally, and probably most importantly, if you have an opportunity, get this article of Fly Fisherman. It's April, May 2014. Those two articles, in my mind, were priceless. The April Vokey article was great, but that Tom Rosenbauer article just kind of tipped the scale in that direction for tube flies. So with that said, let me reset up this camera, change the angle a little bit, and then talk about this mix and match system that really just got me to jump all in in the world of tube flies. In this section, I'm going to show you some of the head styles that Tom recommends and some that I've had success with. You're going to notice this is truly a keep it simple of tube flies. For starters, you have one that looks really similar to the woolly bugger in my vise right now, minus the tail. Remember, that's going to come on a different section of tube that we're going to be connecting to this one. That's why I've left a nice gap in the rear of this one. Uh, really simple. We just have some crystal flash over the tube. That's it. If you want to add some wire underneath to add some weight, absolutely go for it, or you can just simply add a cone onto your line prior to, um, or I guess prior to putting this one onto your tippet. Some other colors that I like to use are really just the common ones. We have chartreuse and white. What's great about having these different colored heads is that, say you want to go with a chartreuse head but a black tail. It's really easy to do that. You don't have to worry about having those set patterns already tied. You can just kind of mix and match as you go. The one thing that I wanna, want you to notice in some of these is that all of them will have the fronts burned. And typically I'm, I'm burning the fronts and the backs prior to tying if I'm gonna have the back burn as well. Tom uh, pretty much in his article recommends having the back burnt too because it creates kind of a little nub which is then easy to put that tube connecting material onto the back to connect this piece to the front of one of your tail sections. So again, for starters, that's just kind of like a, a simple woolly bug style, a woolly bugger style of a really simple tube fly. And then just looking at it from that woolly bugger perspective, here's one that I have tied on a slightly larger tube. Um, really just simple. I mean, we're talking variegated chenille, some hen hackle or some schloppen. Um, what I love about this schloppen is that it takes on that ostrich hurl type look at the front. Um, so it really just has a lot of breathability in the water. But again, this is just a great system because this is my headpiece. For the tailpiece, I can have marabou. I can have a zonker tail. I can have deer tail. Really, you know, the possibilities are just really endless. And it just depends on what type of material I'm looking for, what type of movement I'm looking for. And if I don't want to lengthen it, I don't have to. I can just fish, fish this piece by itself attached to the hook. All right, the next one is really just a basic one that's a no-frills fly. This is, as Paul Jorgensen said, there's flies for a go and there's flies for show. And this is definitely one of the flies for the go. I mean, this is very similar to a black ghost. We're talking a yellow tube, no body material, just some silver tinsel, marabou on the bottom, marabou on the top. That's it. Uh, I can fish this just as is. If you notice, my material doesn't go back too far, so it won't necessarily cover the hook or I can add this to a marabou tail or one of the other tails that I'll be showing you later on in the video. Just a really successful fly. That white color just works really well to imitate a lot of the, the bait fish in the waters where I fish. Oops, I think I locked that one in there. All right, next, and we're gonna continue down the path of extremely easy, and I can't really say to tie because this one is not a pattern that I consider being tied. This is the, the gummy minnow. You can also use, I think the material was called the uh, the silly skin. Uh, this is just, I mean, I mean, down and dirty. Uh, it looks like a minnow. Simple material. You just cut it out. 
Um, it, it adheres to itself in the all over this section in the back. Um, if you notice, I, I did burn the back of this tube as well, so I can connect this to a tailpiece. If I want to add tail, I have some red eyes on it that are just covered with a little bit of UV glue. But this is just down and dirty. Uh, I can fish this, fish this pattern just as is, or again, I can add on a tail section. I typically will add a tail section, and it will typically be some type of like a, a strip of rabbit. For the next pattern, uh, this is one of my favorite ones. I actually just tied this one a little bit ago. This is of the Puglisi style, uh, which is just using craft fur. You'll notice this fur is wet uh, because I happened to wet this one afterwards. See how, how it looked wet, which it looks really nice wet. Um, the, the, the pattern's meant to fish this way. Uh, I have some eyes on it, covered with UV glue at the head. Uh, craft fur on top, a little bit of chartreuse lateral line material underneath it. On the bottom, craft fur with a little bit of red crystal flash. You'll notice I have red in a lot of my patterns. Uh, it's just the color I like to have in there, not in an excessive form, but just to have a little bit of red either in the eyes, in the head, uh, maybe going back the lateral line, especially underneath. Um, this is just a simple pattern tied with some really just basic materials that you probably already have lying on your bench. Uh, but what's great about this one, you'll notice the material goes approximately one inch past the tube. So I can fish this fish this one directly attached to the hook, or again, I could add on a tailing material, a tailing tube, and then place the hook behind that if I want to extend the length of my pattern. All right, I have two more I want to show you. The next one is without a doubt the most common one. Um, it's the one I have tied up the most in my box of tube flies whenever I'm going striper fishing, and that's the Clouser Minnow. I mean, this is just your everyday down and dirty pattern. Um, couple things to notice. I did not burn the end of this one um, because typically with these clousers, though I, I consider them the head component, I don't I don't always put on a tail tube. Can you? Absolutely. And the tail tube would probably be just an extension of uh, deer tail. So I'll probably just have some all white deer tails, some chartreuse, maybe some black deer tails um, that I could add if I want to extend the length of this pattern. Otherwise, I will fish this one pretty much by itself. I just some chartreuse on top, some white on the bottom. I have a little bit of weight in those eyes, so the, the fly will ride just the way you see it right now. Uh, an all-around great pattern. I recommend, uh, if you're getting into the world of tube flies, just look at your clouser section of your box right now and just mimic it in tubes, and trust me, you won't regret it whatsoever. The beauty is, again, you can add some different tails to these now to really just add a little bit more movement um, afterwards. So just imagine this giant like five or six inch pattern just really just jigging up and down in the water. Uh, it just will drive these fish crazy. Then the last one that I'm going to show you, and this is going to be the one that I'll tie. And it's just a zonker style of pattern. Uh, the colors are completely up to you. Uh, this is These are colors that I could use with trout, that I could use salt water, I could use with steelhead. Uh, just a great color combination. A fuchsia zonker strip with some black crystal flash underneath. A down and dirty pattern that just catches fish. Um, I'll add weight to this one because I do typically like to get this one down. Even though once you get this zonker strip wet, it will just you know naturally sink and uh, have a little bit of a jigging motion to it. Um, but this really will wrap up the head section of of the patterns that I use the most. There's a few more that Tom recommends. Um, you can have just a, a deer hair head, and we're talking like a muddler style or a Dahlberg diver. We can have just a deceiver head. You can have a squid. You can add cones to any of these. Uh, you can have a gurgler. You can have sand eels. You can have foam poppers. Again, the possibilities are absolutely endless whenever we're talking about these head styles. So um, as I mentioned earlier, if, if any of these have kind of sparked those creative juices in you and you have another idea of something that wasn't mentioned, please uh, mention it in the comments section so we can get other guys really involved in, in all these, these patterns that are out there and we can really just move forward in this world because, again, the possibilities are just absolutely endless. So with that said, uh, let me get everything reset, and I'm just going to tie this pattern for you. It's a really quick one, uh, but it's without a doubt one of the ones that I recommend you having in your box. All right, to get started tying this zonker style, I'm just going to grab a 1 8 inch size tube. I'm just going to burn the end of it. Once I, let, I get that really nice and hot. I like to immediately place it on that piece, That just so I know that that hole is not going to burn shut too fast. 
just come to the back side of it, do the same thing. I'm going to burn this just like Tom recommends in the video. Do I always burn the back? No, but whenever I'm doing the more of a head style, I like to have that back done as well. Okay, nothing more than that. Get it in there, it'll dry within just a few seconds. So while that's drying, I'll just get my vise set up. Let's try now. Let me lock this in. All right, so I have my tube, it's ready to go. Uh, a couple things, without a doubt, I treat this just like I would treat any normal style of zonker that I'm gonna tie. I'm gonna immediately grab some lead wire, some 015, I want a little bit of weight. It's gonna be more than enough there. You don't have to be too pretty with this stuff, especially on this style of fly. Just going to use a little bit of a uh, unithread. This is black, 6 aught. And I'm going to start it just a little bit back. So I have a little bit of room to, to tie off for my, um, for my zonker, the head of the pattern. I notice this is turning just a little bit, so let me tighten this up again. Okay. Get that lead wire semi-covered. I'm not. I'm not going to worry too much about it. It's not absolutely critical. Okay. Now I'm next going to grab a piece of zonker strip. I already have this cut, and I. I want to see which way the uh, material is going to flow. And if you look, the material is naturally going to my left, your right. If I try to pull it the other way, it won't go. It'll just look like a bad haircut. So I want it flowing so that whenever it's on the hook, it's going to go with the water flow. Whenever I strip it back, those fibers are going to go straight back. Now, I have seen some people that fish in this way, and they like that whenever they pull through the water, it really kind of stresses these fibers in a sense, and they really seem to flare. That's not the look that I'm necessarily going for. This is the look, so I'm just going to, I'm going to stick with this style. And to tie it in, I'm just going to turn it upside down and lock a really healthy piece of the hide underneath my thread. I really want to make sure that's secure. And in fact, in some instances, I have tied this with uh, some wire. Um, and I'll tie the wire in either before that or right now at this point. And after I have everything else tied in and this piece locked down, then I'll take that wire and wind it through my, uh, my strip because I don't want that strip to, to be removed. Being that I'm looking at this from, it's a, it's a head section of an extended body tube fly, there's going to be two tubes, more than likely the fish are not going to have any opportunity to really rip this piece off. But with that said, I'm really going to just kind of use this as the insurance policy and just make sure everything's locked down really, really tight at the back and at the front. Alright, next I'm just going to cut a strip of some black crystal, crystal chenille. Just lock this in. Again, this is really not a pretty fly by any means. It just works really well. Let me get to the front. I'm just going to put a quick half hitch. I am going to use the um, the rotary feature of this vise. You'll notice this is my um, my Stonfo tube fly vise. See if I can just turn the camera a hair to give you a better peek at this. It's a really sleek vise. Um, it works really well, especially whenever you have materials like this. So I can just rapidly accelerate them. Um, I can just loosen it a hair and then just wrap this forward really quickly. And you'll see it'll cover the hook in just a really short amount of time. And that lead kind of got pinched forward, so I'm just going to do my best to cover it. I'll hold my material in place. may have to wrap back just a hair to make sure that lead wire is completely covered. My excess, I'm just going to wind back. It really doesn't, I'm not going to sweat that too much. All right, so um, now I'm just going to bring this back, and I have just one final step, and that's to, to pull this hide directly over. And to me, this is really a crucial step. I mean, I do want to pull some of these fibers down to make sure they're going to have uh, their best chance at really being seen by the fish, but most importantly, I want to make sure that I lock it in at this point. So whenever I bring this forward, I'm, I'm going to give it a little bit of a, a tug, and then at this point, I really just 
you really got to wind down. Now, if you um, really want a pretty head, uh, you know, go for that. I'm not going to, I don't stress so much on these tube flies with making them that, that beautiful finished product that I tend to with a lot of my trout flies. In this case, I want to make sure that whenever I have this zonker strip, everything's secure and it's not going to be going anywhere. So I will add a lot of thread at the front of this to completely cover that zonker strip, but also to make sure that it's locked securely in place. So if it seems excessive, it probably is, but that's just, that's going to be the mentality that I have with this style of pattern. All right, so I have that locked in place. My tube's turning just a hair. I give it a quick, quick whip finish. I'm going to give it a second one. Now I can either add head cement or instead I grab just a little bit of this Sally Hansen hard as nails. Sean, if you're watching, I did add a little bit of my uh, head cement thinner to this, so it's working a lot better. Thank you. I'm just going to add some of that to my thread. Take my finger, just move it a little bit up and down, and then make sure that that glue is really on there as I work my final whip finish towards the front. And with that, there is my finished head. Sorry, I got, I got that in your way. I apologize, guys. There's my finished zonker head. Um, just a really quick tie. Extremely effective. Um, it just is a great contrast in the water. I like having this pink tube under underneath it. I, again, I don't stress too much on those tubes, but it, it really does pre perform a little bit better, I really believe, because we have that pink contrasting with the black. Then we got the fuchsia here, the black body. I mean, there's a lot going on with this pattern. What's nice about it, it does extend back past the tube. This zonker strip is one of the magnum strips. So I can fish this just with a hook if I want. I don't have to necessarily put a second tube on it. If I was going to fish this just with a hook, I'd probably prefer to have some, some wire wrapped throughout as kind of a ribbing and more of a protection for this piece. But in this sense, and in this case, this is my finished product. Um, I use this black chenille a lot with chartreuse on top as well, just black on black. Um, I've used white, the, the, the white uh, crystal flash chenille with black rabbit on top. I mean, don't be afraid to just try a bunch of different color combinations and see what works for you in your waters. Um, so with that said, um, that was a look at some of the heads. I tied one of the heads for you. Next, I'm just going to show you some of the tails that Tom mentions and some that, that I've also used uh, in this wonderful world of tube flies. Finally, let's take a peek at some of the tailing sections that are out there for these tube style of patterns. The first one, and really common in saltwater applications, is strung saddle hackle. The reasons are simple. They're easy to tie on and they catch fish. In this case, I just have two or three white saddles tied on each side and I topped it off with thread, nothing more. It's really easy to, to use this as a tailing section, basically behind almost any head style that I've previously shown you. Um, whenever I'm using white or a lighter style of tail, I prefer to use either red thread or a color that matches that hackle. Whenever I'm using any darker hackles, I'll go again with either the red thread or probably black. I just try to keep it as simple as possible with those lighter colors. Let me remove this one. And the next most common type of tailing material is easily going to be just a clouser style of deer tail. Uh, what's nice about this is that you can keep it really sparse. You can tie it on really quick. You don't have to worry about the eyes. And these are just really easy to add on to the, the head section to extend that clouser. So if I hold this up, and then you can now imagine that if I've had this piece on the line already, and I need to extend it and make it into a longer pattern, that's going to be really easy to do. Uh, as always with all of my clouser styles, I like to keep these very sparse. Whenever I'm thinking about the tubes to use for these, I really do give it a little bit more thought than some of the other tailing styles. Um, I prefer to go with either a fluorescent color to contrast with that material, or I'll go with just clear to absolutely keep it simple. Uh, next, uh, this tailing material is what Tom is considering to be one of those just sleepers of this category and it's ostrich hurl. Fly fishermen who have been using spay flies probably already know about the magical, we'll say, characteristics of this material. 
and it is just wonderful in the water. If you have not yet used ostrich hurl as a tailing material, I absolutely encourage you to get out there, purchase some of colors of this stuff, get it tied onto some tubes, and then put it in the water. You will just absolutely fall in love with it whenever you see its breathability once it's wet. Whenever I think about this material, I mean, I pair this naturally with my zonker style fly. And when you see the two of these together, let me see if I can hold this up so you can view them. <laughs> what fish would say no to that combination? I mean, you just have a lot of movement with these patterns. You have that flash at the head section, and then you have this fuchsia that's really just going to contrast with everything. This is just an absolutely killer combination. If you're in the world of bass fishing, you probably already know about the benefits of rubber legs. Now, from a saltwater perspective, by having rubber legs tied simply on a tube like this, you're really going after that squid in terms of an imitation. However, if you want to pair the rubber legs with marabou, with saddle hackle, absolutely go for it. There's also a lot of individuals that for the head section, they'll just tie this in with the chenille whenever they're making kind of a wooly bugger style head with these rubber legs sticking out, um, just basically because they work. They get off, give off some great vibrations in the water, and if you go for a contrasting color, you can really attract the, the attention of the fish. Whenever I'm using these rubber legs, I will pair them sometimes with marabou, but typically the head that I use is going to be a crystal flash head just because I love that black chartreuse combination, and these things really just give off great vibrations in the water. And then finally, without a doubt, the most common material that you'll find in my tube fly box is going to be marabou. Um, it's just easy to use, it costs just a minimal, uh, and the color combinations are absolutely endless. This is chartreuse, it's more of a barred chartreuse, and I tied it on a really small tube. Same with this white, this is just plain white, probably the most common color that I use. But the reason I like to keep these on shorter tubes is simple, and that's because we can stack these in front of one another. Imagine you're out fishing and there's alewives in the water and you realize that your imitation's only three and a half or four inches long and the, the naturals are six. What you can do is just grab another section of marabou and add it directly to your fly and now you instantly have that correct measurement. So um, the possibilities again with these tailing materials are just absolutely endless and I encourage you to, to check some more out to post any that you think would be you know, beneficial to everybody else's fishing and um, really just get out there and fish them and see how the fish react to them. Well, with all that said, I am going to wrap up this video. As always, thanks for the view, and if you'd like to watch more of my YouTube fly tying tutorials, please view those on my website at troutandfeather.com. Also, if you're a fan of Facebook, I encourage you, encourage you to check out Trout and Feather and like the page, and I give some occasional updates on there in regards to these fly tying tutorials. Well, this was part four of Tying Tube Flies. I hope you enjoyed this one and look for a couple additional videos to come in the future. Thanks everybody for viewing this YouTube fly tying tutorial. And as always, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to leave them directly on this YouTube page or you can email me at tkamisa at gmail.com.